cases where mutations in the same gene have been found to be uh, causative of uh, different uh, phenotypic presentations, but it's really striking for frontotemporal dementia and another neurodegenerative disease that is called uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. And so, indeed, both diseases are uh, clinically different, and frontotemporal dementia is the second uh, cause of uh, dementia in adults. Uh, it's characterized by language and behavioral dysfunction, and um, compared to Alzheimer's disease, uh, the uh, memory is uh, really uh, well preserved, and uh, it's characterized by uh, behavioral abnormalities that are mostly um, with abnormal social interaction, uh, and uh, typically with disinhibition and impulsive uh, behaviors. There are also language uh, dysfunctions that can be more or less severe, and uh, groups of patients have been clinically defined depending on what is more prominent in the phenotype. And uh, this disease is mostly um, starting uh, relatively earlier than Alzheimer's disease, usually in the 50s or 60s, and um, it affects mostly uh, the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. Uh, as uh, described by the name of the disease. On the contrary, uh, in the other hand, you have this amyotrophic lateral sclerosis uh, pathology that is uh, also called in uh, US as Lou Gehrig's disease. And here you can see that the neurons affected are completely different. They are the motor neurons. And there are two types of motor neurons, one that goes from the brain to the spinal cord, and another one that go, I mean, another type that go from the spinal cord to the muscles. And they are really important for um, the uh, direction of movements. So uh, ALS is characterized by a progressive paralysis. It's a very severe disease that can start usually um, in the, also in the fourth or fifth decades, but uh, the onset is very variable. And there are some very severe cases in the 20s, as well as some uh, very late onset. But you can see that both diseases do not really appear as being um, in the same spectrum. However, in the last uh, few years, it has been really recognized that they actually overlap. And so uh, both of them, they are characterized by most, in most of the case, the patients are sporadic, meaning they do not have a family history. Also, I think it's quite striking that for frontotemporal dementia, a large proportion seems to have a family history, and it seems that the genetics uh, is a strong burden in this uh, pathology. But uh, a few genes were known for uh, several years and mostly studied, and I will come back to that. Uh, but you are going to see in my talk that over the last, I would say, six to eight years, everything has changed uh, in these two diseases in terms of genetics. And uh, the first thing uh, was to recognize that they clinically overlap. When, what I mean by that is the fact that some patients have both ALS and frontotemporal dementia. They can start by one and then develop the other, or can start uh, by the, uh, ALS and develop frontotemporal dementia. We have also recognized that in some families, you have some patients with ALS, while another patient has a frontotemporal dementia. And so this is a striking uh, um, family tree where some patients have a pure ALS syndrome and others have just a frontotemporal dementia, while some of the siblings have developed both ALS and FTD. So uh, this has um, uh, been uh, striking in, in the genetic uh, field because uh, patient, um, uh, geneticists who were studying these families started to think that maybe some genes are uh, responsible for the, sa for the same, so the same gene is responsible for the different phenotypes in this type of family. And another thing that, uh, uh, made this correlation between uh, ALS and frontotemporal dementia is uh, the pathology studies. And so we have discussed since yesterday uh, the uh, fact that neurodegenerative disease include um, aggregation of abnormal proteins and obviously um, the plaques in Alzheimer's disease have been uh, described. And uh, it's also the case for frontotemporal dementia and for, and for 
uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Also, strikingly, FTD do not present the same pathology. So FTD patients have a pathology that was recognized for very long to be um, ubiquitin positive inclusions. And so using an anticore that recognized ubiquitin, these aggregates were found in neurons from frontotemporal dementia, but they were also found in neurons from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And it's only in 2006 that it was recognized that actually these aggregates, they contain mostly the same protein in both, Alzheimer, uh, in both ALS patients and frontotemporal dementia patients. And this protein, maybe you have already heard about it, it's called TDP43. And so this is a protein that is normally mostly in the nucleus of the neurons but, and of every cell. But in patients, you can see that it's localized in uh, the cytoplasm. And uh, there is this particular feature that we call a nuclear clearance of TDP43 in affected neurons. And it seems that the function of this protein in this nucleus is going to be altered because the protein is not localized where it should be. And this was found uh, in uh, ALS, as I told you, as well as in frontotemporal dementia, and mostly in sporadic cases. But then geneticists went back to the gene encoding for this protein, and they found several families that actually had mutations in this gene. And so these mutations, they are uh, highlighted here, and you can see they are point mutations dominantly inherited. And this single base pair point mutation leads to uh, changes in amino acids at the protein level. And you can see that it's, they are mostly clustered in a region that we call prion-like domain. And what we think is that the mis these mutations induce the misfolding of the protein and induce these aggregations in the cytoplasm that I have just described and that you can see here. So the patients that do not have a mutation, they can have this feature. And the patients with a mutation, they have actually really similar features where you see some neurons uh, have TDP43 normally in the nucleus but sometimes it goes in the cytoplasm and sometimes forms really big aggregates. And so this link, this pathological link between familial forms and the vast majority of sporadic patients is really important for us because by studying how TDP43 misaggregates, we may get insights for the vast majority of patients. Interestingly, in the few years that followed this discovery of TDP43, and other genes was found also to be mutated. And it's called first TLS. And it has several particularities that are very close to TDP43. I'm going to describe here. So first of all, you can see some domains of the protein are the same. And these domains are linked to the functions of this protein. And this protein have a function that is quite related. They are both what we call RNA binding proteins. So they are proteins that bind many, many RNAs and are involved in the processing of these RNAs. And so they are going to alter many genes downstream when these particular proteins are not doing that job. Another feature is that first TLS, when it's mutated, it's also abnormally localized uh, and aggregated mostly in the cytoplasm, but also in the nucleus. And so these point mutations in TDP53 and in first TLS they are mostly associated with patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. But I already told you that TDP53 without mutation can be aggregated in uh, FTD and ALS patients without a mutation. And it's the same for first TLS. So first TLS was found to be aggregated in a subset of patients that have frontotemporal dementia and didn't have uh, these TDP43 aggregates, but they have first aggregates. So this has allowed a new um, classification of the pathology in both diseases. And this is a schematic of uh, where we are now in terms of the pathological inclusions in both these diseases. And you can see the commonalities. For, for ALS, most patients, and in particular this very vast majority of sporadic patients, they have TDP43 accumulations. But you can see that a 
large portion of frontotemporal dementia have also TDP photosphere accumulation. Another portion have tau, and we've seen that also yesterday, have tau, tau um, uh, pathology, while a smaller portion have this first pathology. Why it becomes a bit more complicated is what is the relationship between the genetics and the pathology, and this is not that straightforward. So, some cases it's easy. For example, when you have a SOD1 mutation, you get a SOD1 pathology. It's the same for first when you have a mutation in an ILS patient, you have a first pathology. But what you can see here is that TDP43 pathology can be um, identified in patients with TDP43 mutations and other genes that I will discuss later, but also in sporadic patients where we do not know or we don't uh, think they have a particular mutation. And it's the same in frontotemporal dementia. TDP43 can be associated with patients that have a familial form with a well-defined mutation in another gene, but many of them do not have an identified mutation. The so tau pathology is mostly associated with mutations in tau, and uh, the first patients or the frontotemporal dementia patient with the first pathology, they usually do not have a first mutation. The first mutation leads to ALS, and we don't understand why, but here, these patients, they don't have a mutation in first, but they aggregate first in their uh, cells. So, uh, and there are some rare uh, cases where we don't, we know a mutation, but we don't really know what is the pathology associated. So we are at a place where the recent advance in pathology and genetics have really um, identified distinct subgroups of patients. And for us, it's very important because it's very likely that there are some uh, common disease mechanism in patients that have TDP43 aggregates, for example. And uh, we uh, want to study and maybe to include patients in uh, clinical trials uh, that would have uh, different uh, disease mechanisms because the strategy might be different. Uh, for these subgroups. And uh, there is really this uh, concept now that ALS and FTD are a continuum of disease, and uh, with some mutations that almost always give ALS, some mutations that always uh, give frontotemporal dementia, but a spectrum of patients and mutations that uh, can give either one. And now, um, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on CNNF72. And the reason why is, first of all, you can see it's at the center of it, and it's really made this really strong link between ALS and FTD. And it also appears to be uh, the most uh, common uh, genetic cause in both FTD and ALS. So this gene was actually identified very recently, in 2011, by two groups. And uh, this is a very particular type of mutations, and I'm going to try to explain what is this type of mutation, and we, I hope you will bear with me. So uh, the mutations I have shown before uh, for TDP or first ELS were the single base pair mutations that change the protein. Here, it's not the case. It's what we call a repeat expansion mutation. In this case, it's an exanucleotide, so six base pair, 4G and 2C, that in the normal population is uh, present at two to approximately 30 repeats. But in patients, what we see is that the number of repeats is expanded and patients can have thousands of this hexanucleotide that is uh, repeated. And um, another feature of this mutation, and we're going to discuss that again, is that it is in a non-coding region of the gene. What I mean by that is that when you have a gene, there are some exons and there are some introns. The introns do not participate to encode uh, what is going to become the protein. The introns are usually spliced or removed and degraded. And uh, so the protein is, uh, is uh, produced Without, we think, without modification, because this mutation is in a region that is non-coding. And as I said, uh, this uh, mutation can go to uh, thousands of repeats, and this is a method to look at the size, and the normal size of this region is this band around here. And you can see that in the brain of patients, there are these thousands of repeats with very large tracks of uh, this hexanucleotide that is accumulated. 
And this is a smear because basically this size is variable depending on which cells. And uh, it's very dynamic. Another uh, thing uh, from uh, C9 of 72, and I'm back to these uh, family trees, is that uh, they uh, are found in both frontotemporal dementia and ALS. And you can see this large family with patients that have a pure ALS, while other patients, siblings, have a frontotemporal dementia. And we have at this point no explanation why a patient is going to develop one or the others. Another point of this family tree that I think is important is that the mutations is uh, as an incomplete penetrance. What we mean by that is that you can uh, be a carrier of this mutation without developing the disease. And so this, for example, individual, you can see his brothers or sisters were affected, and he has um, uh, an offspring who is also affected. So is a carrier of the mutation but he has not developed the disease, and this is the case for other um, patients in this tree. And what it means here, and it's really correlated to the fact that we have now identified hundreds and actually thousands of patients with C9 of 72 mutations. It's a very common cause of frontotemporal dementia and ALS. And many of these patients actually didn't seem to have a family history, so they were classified as sporadic patients. And one of the reasons, and at least in a few cases where the parents could be analyzed, the parents indeed had the mutation, but for reasons that we don't know and certainly factors that are uh, influencing the uh, start of the disease, these um, individuals are not developed that. And so there are a lot of debates now uh, to know who should be tested and should we test in an 72 for example, in patients without a family history. Uh, when they have FTD or ALS. So now I'm going to go more into the disease mechanism. And so what does this mutation do? So it's, it's a big expansion, and I told you it's in a non-coding region of the, of the gene. And so basically, uh, a basic concept is that when you have a mutation, it could stop the transcription of the gene. So you lose the function of this gene. It could also give an RNA that contains a mutation, and we have now evidence that RNA that with certain type of mutation can be toxic. Or it can give you a protein that is toxic, as we have seen for TDP43 or for first mutation. And um, the, the thing with uh, expansion diseases is that it depends a lot on where the expansion lies within the gene. And so here it's a scheme of a gene with exons are the parts that are going to give rise to the protein. And you have the parts that are not coding, so the introns and, and the untranslated regions that do not uh, participate to uh, the coding of the proteins. And so there are some uh, expansion diseases that are also known as uh, triniclotide disease or polyglutamine disease. And the uh, major uh, one is Huntington, where there is a repeat a triniclotide repeat in this case, that is normally um, uh, to a certain range of repeats and that this is higher in patients. And when it's in a coding region, the protein becomes toxic. But, oops, sorry. But there are other diseases with repeat expansion and one is fragile X mental retardation that the repeat lies in non-cutting regions and there is a loss of function. And as I also described before, there are diseases where the RNA contains this mutation and becomes toxic. So as you can see, various mechanisms can be in involved in um, expansion repeat disease. What happens for C9 of 72? So what we know is that for C9 of 72, it is not in an exon. So it does not involve the formation of uh, toxic uh, CNN of 72 protein. But what about the rest? And I'm going to discuss this different mechanism. And basically, I don't think it's really necessarily important to understand in detail each mechanism. But what is important is to see that the same mutation can actually have different effects leading to the neuronal death. And so 
one possibility is that CNN of 72 function is lost because this expansion induces uh, um, repression of the transcription of the gene. CNN of 72, we don't know the function. It's called actually this barbaric name for chromosome 9 open reading frame 72, which means we have no idea what it does. We just know it's on chromosome 9. Another type, and it's a bit what I've described before, is that if you have your repeat in a non-coding part of the gene, and in this case in introns, you still um, produce RNA that contains a repeat. And there is a mechanism that has been recently, uh, in the last 10 years, described where this RNA that contains these thousands of repeats is toxic for the cell. This RNA that contains this, toxic, this uh, repeat is also, was also shown very recently to lead to uh, the production of aberrant proteins. They are not C9 of 72 proteins, but they are proteins that come from this very long repeat. And so you have aggregation of aberrant polypeptides that can also be important in the mechanism. And what's uh, striking is that in uh, cells from patients, we see marks of any of this mechanism. So we see that indeed the level of C9 of 72 is lowered. And what does it mean? Is it responsible for uh, the neuronal death? We also see that this RNA with very strong uh, and long tracks of repeats, they accumulate into the nuclei. And I'm going to come back to that, into what we call RNA foci. And we also see that there are some proteins that are translated from this expanded repeat. And so all of these features are part of C9 of 72 pathology, and we are now trying to understand what is the relative contribution of this different mechanism. And um, what I want to highlight here is that also in most neurodegenerative disease, we are talking about aggregation of proteins. For C9 of 72, we have um, evidence that there is also aggregation of RNA. And the way you see that is that you take a probe that recognize your expanded repeat. And we did that in fibroblasts, so fibroblasts are skin cells from patients. And you can see this aggregates in the nucleus that correspond to RNA with these thousands of repeats. And you really don't see that in a control uh, individual. Importantly, we can see that in peripheral cells, and these are skin biopsy cells, you can see that in immortalized lymphoblast, and this is really important for research, and maybe it will be important as biomarkers to look at what is happening to this RNA foci when we uh, treat a patient with a particular drug. But it's strikingly present in uh, the uh, central nervous system of these patients, and I just have a few pictures where I show you spinal motor neurons, obviously for ALS patients, they are the motor neurons that die, and they contain this RNA foci, but also in uh, the motor cortex, and actually in every region that we have looked. So uh, in the cerebellum, you can see it uh, in different, uh, in the granular layers, but also in the Purkinje cells. So this uh, RNA accumulates, and it's a different concept from the protein accumulation that we are used to for Parkinson and Alzheimer's disease. It's really at another level, but it still uh, seems to be toxic uh, to the cells. And uh, obviously we concentrate on neurons because they are dying, but in the brain, other cells are very important, and they are also present in uh, what we call glial cells, astrocytes and microglia. I'm going to add a layer of complexity there, but it's okay, it's not that bad. But I showed you that there is this uh, hexanucleotide that is 4G and 2C that accumulates. I showed you the RNA foci. And this is when this gene is transcribed in this direction. But we have learned from other expansion disease that actually when there is a large track of repeats, there is something abnormal that is happening and it is a transcription in the reverse direction, which means that we are going maybe to accumulate RNA that contains this G4C2, but also RNA that contains this C4G2. So because it was described in other fields, other diseases with repeat expansion, and, and I think our field is really learning and, and advancing so fast because we're taking advantage of, of that, of what has been learned for 10 years in myotonic dystrophy or in fragile X, 
we went and we looked, can it happen also for Sinan of 72? And so we used another probe that recognized this anti-sense trend. And indeed, in patients with Sinan of 72, we see also that this RNA is accumulating. Which means we come back here a bit to what the previous speaker was saying. So what, what are the targets? What do we need to um, treat and to get rid of? And maybe to look at one sense, uh, one strand is not going to be enough. And we will have also to take into account that the patient says, have uh, RNA that contains these large expansions that are transcribed from the other direction. And this has been uh, now very confirmed by many studies and it's really clear that uh, it's more complex than what, what we thought. And so here I have shown you evidence that there is accumulation of RNA that uh, is involved in what we call an RNA toxicity mechanism. Now I'm going to go to an even more recently described mechanism, which is called RAN translation. And this uh, indeed has been discovered by this breakthrough study uh, by Laura Rannon's group uh, in 2011. So it's very recent. We don't really understand how it works. I just wanted to show you how things are going fast. And uh, really the principle is that expansions that are in a region that is not coding, so this is an intron, it's supposed to be removed. Yeah, the big squares are the exons that are going to give you the protein. So this is supposed to be removed, but it's actually not removed, and we saw that this part is accumulating. And here what this group has shown is that it's actually used to be translated into protein. And it can start anywhere, and depending on where it starts, it gives you different types of protein. And so here you have proteins that are glycine alanine repeats. And because you have thousands of these repeats, there are very long track of glycine alanine proteins. And if it starts one base pair later, then it's glycine proline. And here it's glycine arginine. And you may remember I told you that it's transcribed in both directions. So at the end, what we end up with are proteins of these D-peptides that are completely abnormal, no, no um, protein in uh, the genome and codes for this long track of D-peptides are produced from the both uh, strand of uh, this uh, mutated gene. And you can see that they really accumulate in uh, cells of patients, and this is uh, how to show you the extent of accumulation of these D-peptides. So it's very recent, we saw that last year, and we don't know what is the contribution to disease, but uh, we think that uh, this is very important that uh, there are these TDP43 aggregates, the same way as for Alzheimer's, the plaques and the, the tangles have been very uh, major in our understanding of disease. We cannot ignore that these patients, they actually accumulate so much uh, pept D-peptide proteins. An important thing is that even if there are different mechanisms, how can we target this gene and what would be the strategy to um, treat this particular mechanism? And one way would be to get rid of this expanded RNA that gives you these RNAs that are aggregated and that gives you also these uh, D-peptide proteins that are accumulated. And one strategy uh, that has been developed and I think is expanded, uh, expanding in several uh, dominantly inherited neurodegenerative disease is the use of what we call antisense oligonucleotides. It has been actually pioneered um, at UCSD by, by Don Cleveland and Richard Smith uh, in collaboration with Isis Pharmaceutical. And it was first pioneered by um, them uh, in uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis with SOD1 mutation. But you can see that now this went to a clinical trial, phase one and a phase two is now planned. A clinical trial for Huntington's disease is planned for next year. Myotonic dystrophy clinical trial started this month. And the spinal muscular atrophy uh, clinical trial is also ongoing in uh, kids with this uh, very severe disease. And so uh, this is a very promising approach that is based on the design of molecules that recognize specific targets and is going to degrade the RNA. So you remember the RNA for Sinan of 72 with this large expansion is aggregated into foci. So can we do that and can we degrade them 
using this type of molecule. And uh, very importantly, uh, this would really go at the source uh, of uh, the disease, like what is a mutated gene, and this is a slide for, for Huntington, but it could exist for uh, any of these non-degenerative diseases where you have a mutation that leads to many pathways that are secondary uh, altered. But here, what we want is really going to go um, at uh, the uh, mutated uh, RNA to get rid of it. And uh, these molecules have been modified. There are uh, many clinical trials. I have uh, highlighted the ones in neurodegenerative disease, but uh, they have been used also in the periphery, and uh, there is actually uh, FDA-approved drug, and uh, the affinity, stability, and tolerability has been much improved. And in the central nervous system, the idea is to put them directly in the uh, CSF. And the reason is that they do not pass the blood-brain barrier. And so we do an intratecal delivery in the cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, this is a study that was uh, done uh, for um, an Huntington's disease uh, clinical trial design, and this is in uh, non-human primates, where you can see that when you, you infuse these molecules in the CSF, uh, in the spinal cord, they actually distribute and diffuse throughout the central nervous system. And so they are going to reduce your protein of interest or your RNA of interest um, throughout the central nervous system. So we have tested that for C9 or 72, and so we have taken different antisense oligonucleotides that are located on the gene, and you can see this expansion is in this non-coding uh, region I have uh, described. And indeed, uh, we have used, in this case, skin uh, fibroblasts from patients, and we can reduce, with all of these oligos, we can reduce uh, the presence of the RNA. And importantly, when we looked at the fossae, so these RNA aggregates, we can indeed reduce these RNA aggregates. So the very good news is that um, this ASO, they can prevent the formation of foci in cells of c 72 patients. And this has actually been done independently by uh, different teams uh, using similar strategy. And so I told you the gene has been found in 2011, and we are, all of these have been published in 2013, where we have identified molecules that can reduce uh, the pathogenic uh, species of uh, RNA. I think this is very encouraging, and it's to show you that knowing the genetic and knowing the mechanism is very important to design therapeutic strategy, and also that we are learning from what has been done in other neurodegenerative diseases. And here it was done for Huntington's, for example, and we just took the same approach. And in two years, we have that. Obviously, there is uh, a lot still to do, and analysis pharmaceutical, also biogen. Uh, are pushing that forward to go to clinical trial. I think the goal is in two years. Uh, but in parallel, there are a lot of studies that are done using different uh, disease models. And I'm not going to go there, but we need to better understand if we need to target the sense and the anti-sense transcripts. I showed you that uh, transcription from the reverse trend was also uh, leading to this uh, foci. And so major efforts are uh, going towards this direction. So the take-home messages are that ILS and FTD are overlapping at the clinical, pathological, and genetic level. I've shown you for TDP-53 and first ILS, both of them are involved in RNA processing, and so RNA processing alteration seems to be central in the pathogenesis of these diseases. And uh, I've not been there, but there are now more and more uh, other genes that encode for RNA binding protein that seems to be indeed involved in both these diseases. But clearly, C9R72 exanucleotide repeat expansion is the most common genetic cause for both ALS and FTD. And it leads to this uh, accumulation of RNAs from both sense and antisense strand with a, a mechanism that is called RNA toxicity. It also leads to this accumulation of very aberrant dipeptide uh, through a, a mechanism called RAN translation. And as I've uh, shown at the end, the development of therapeutic approach directly targeting mutant mRNA seem to be very promising in dominant neurodegenerative disease. So thank you for your attention, and these are various collaborators, particularly John Revitz at UCSD, 
I've worked very closely for the Sina North 72 study. Don Cleveland uh, is my mentor, and I've done my postdoc with him, and uh, work still very closely. Uh, this pharmaceutical has been very great to work with, uh, and these are different people at UCSD who have been involved in these studies. Thank you very much.